Welcome to RestroCast. Today, my guest is Stratus Morfogan. He's the founder and CEO of Brooklyn Chop House and Brooklyn Dumplings Shop. Stratus is, in his own words, a restauranteur from the womb. Somebody who decided at the age of six that he's going to be a restauranteur. Comes from a fam family where his father owned multiple iconic restaurants in New York. Talking to Stratus felt like, you know, I'm almost like watching a Hollywood flick, you know, which had, um, I don't know if it was it was comedy, but there was a lot of drama. There was a lot of emotions, a uh, lot of wins, a lot of fails. But the hero was emerging out as a hero at the end each time. This was really crazy conversation. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Welcome to Restrocast. Stratis, thanks. Welcome to Restrocast, and thanks for doing this. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I want to, you know, I when we were having the conversation earlier, you, you know, you talked about that you were a restauranteur from the womb. Tell me about that. What were your early years? Where did it all, where did it all oh, start? I mean, I was going, to, there's a story in my book, and it's a true story, that, you know, at the age of six, my mother said, hey, you know, because my father worked every weekend. He had about, at any given time, he had nine restaurants. My mother's like, we're going to Disney World. And my brother and sister are jumping up and down. They're three years older than me. They were nine and ten. Jumping up and down, going to Disney World. I'm like, Dad, what's the, do you have, Uncle Peter or you, who has the truck this weekend? He's like, I have the truck. I said, Mom, I'm not going. I want to go to the Fulton Fish Market with Dad. And she's like, what? My father's like, what? Disney World. Mickey Mouse. And I'm like, nah. I said, my Disney World is the Fulton Fish Market. <laughs> oh, I wow. love the Fulton Fish Market. Wow. And uh, at six years old, I would jump in the truck with him at four in the morning. Go to the Fulton Fish Market, see all the all the guys there, all the energy. The you know, I learned my first math lesson at the Fulton Fish Market when Herb Slavin, who's an icon in the fish market, was fighting over my dad for a nickel. Um, and I thought I, I popped out a nickel and I handed it to my father. I said, "Why are you guys fighting? You guys are friends. Here's the nickel." My father puts me on the dirty fish box and says, "Hey, it's not a nickel. It's 800 pound box of halibut. 800 nickels is what we're talking about." That was my first math, math lesson. You know, you're not going to learn that in school. <laughs> you know, yeah. I knew what 800 lick nickels are when it's an 800 pound box and they're fighting over 85 and 80 cents. So from the womb, yeah, and it went right into my bloodstream as soon as I came out. And, and it's never stopped. I knew what I wanted to do at the age of six. It affected my schooling because I didn't want to, I didn't want to learn about algebra and calculus and all this crap. But to me, it was not, not a part of my life. I wanted to learn how many nickels it's going to take to get an 800 pound box of halibut. And, and that's how I was brought up. And my father at first was resistant, but then realized that, you know what? This is what, you know, this makes him happy. He's happy at the Fulton Fish Market instead of Disney World. He's happy being a busboy at midnight instead of, you know, being tucked in like his friends are watching cartoons with chocolate milk. I'm sitting there running a restaurant at 10 years old and nine years old as a busboy. And that was in my blood. I knew exactly what I wanted to do and I never wavered from it. It was like, phew. Turbo mode. What was your What is your memory of like what was fascinating for you as a kid, given that you knew that you were you're gonna run the restaurant, right? But there must be the parts of your father's journey, your uncle's journey that you you just loved. You just wanted to be. I, I wanted to be part of the energy. The energy was phenomenal to me. If you ever been to the Fulton Fish Market in the olden days, you know there's fire burning and there's you know people you know keeping their hands warm, fish being flung around. I mean you, you see like you know big swordfish being put in. And as far as I went, they were bringing the tractor trailers in and the, the tuna was almost alive. I mean, it was so cool for me. I mean, I just, it, to me, it was like National Geographic because I, I, I still to this day love that. I can show. almost see the see the scene right oh, now, the way it, you painted it it. it. it was incredible. And today I have a view of the whole sea, seaport, but it obviously it's not the way I remember it, except for the two ships. To me, it was like, I, I wanted to be nowhere else but there. And I learned about, I learned about this life from the Fulton Fish Market. And I always said it should be a movie because it was such a glamorous place, but such a dirty place. It's such a corrupt place. But to me, it was like Hollywood, Hollywood East. 
was the Fulton Fish Market. You had the biggest gangsters running it. You had the action of the fish. My uncle was the buyer of the Grand Central Oyster Bar on top of it. He was the largest single fish buyer, <clears throat> excuse me, in the market. He bought for the whole Grand Central Oyster Bar. And George Morfogan, he walked in, you know, we were just a bunch of Greeks. You know, meanwhile, the Italian mob ran the whole market. They showed my father and my uncle such respect, but, you know, they were the biggest customers. And I saw that, you know, I was looking at people and I called them Uncle Ali and this and that. And as I'm getting 13 and 14 and seeing them being arrested or seeing them in the news, I'm like, wow, this guy runs a crime family. Wow. I know him as like my, my, my uncle, you know, my pal, <laughs> my adopted uncle, not blood uncle. But, but, you know, I grew up in that, that field and I, and I got to applaud my father because it's a very unconventional way to bring up a child. But I will tell you, it's the best education you could ever have. What was, what was his restaurants about? Uh, he had everything. He had six Chelsea House restaurants. He was, the first spokes, he was the first spokesperson for American Express in 1975. I could even, I, I was so into his work, I could recite you the whole commercial. You know, my name is John Morfogan, CEO of the Chelsea Chop House. When you come to the Ch Chelsea Chop House, we only accept one card, the American Express card. And when you bring your American Express card, you could have anything on the menu except for the fish mounted on the wall. Last time I heard that, I was 10 years old. And that's, wow. you know, that was the impact he had on me. And, um, and you know, that was the beginning of my journey. So six Chelsea Chop House and... Uh, he had a, a, another seafood restaurant, South Shore Manor Catering Hall, Golden Reef Diner, Hilltop Diner. It, you know, if you ever saw my big fat Greek wedding, that's pretty much my biography. You know, my dad had every type of restaurant you could imagine. We lived in an old 200 year old colonial and we had the Greek flag hanging from an old 200 year old classic home. <laughs> But the Greek flag was 20 feet high. <laughs> Fascinating. And, you know, what was your first experience as a restaurant here? Like at what at what age? You know, did you did you join him early on, or did yeah, you... I always work with my dad. I, I don't think I had a I don't think I had a full weekend off from six years old to eighteen. I think the first weekend I had a full weekend off was my prom. I worked every weekend, and then I'd work three or four days after school. And my father was a type like, hey, you want that drum set? You want that stereo? Work an extra day as a busboy. Work an extra day as a waiter. Work as a... and that's how we grew up. And I do try to do the same with my kids, but I'm failing at that. <laughs> I'm pretty much failing at that point. I try to, I try to be that, but no, that's, um, th that's, you know, it, it, you know, so my, my first real experience was, you know, seven years old right? and I write about it in my book. Uh, I want to know why my dad treats this old little man with such respect. The old little man comes in, he's got like three bodyguards. I don't know who he is. You know, then I hear them saying, get Mr. Gambino his drink, get Mr. Gambino this, get Mr. Gambino his table. This is like 1973. And, you know, I'm a little chubby busboy. I come to the table. He's there with all his mafiosi and all his capos. And I walk over and he's being extremely discreet. Doesn't want anybody to know who he is. You know, and I go, good evening, Mr. Gambino. <laughs> and I'm six years old. The guy's like, the whole table just froze. And I'm like, what did I do wrong? You know, and, and, he, and then he goes, come here, kid, sit over here, sit on his lap. He goes, hi, is good enough. I said, okay. And he puts a $20 bill in my pocket. And I'm like, that's cool. I'll take that all day long. <laughs> and, and that was my first lesson in discretion. Restaurant tours, you need to know a lot of things, not just food service and atmosphere. You mm. need to understand discretion. You need to understand your clients. Mm. There's a lot of moving parts that can sink you or make you a master restaurant tour. And again, you can't read a lot of this out of a book. Who's going to read that out of a book? And with that lesson, he would come in every week and I would say hi and I'd get my 20 bucks. <laughs> oh, that's a good high. Yeah, I mean, it was Carlo Gambino, the boss of the Gambino family. And he would come in like every Thursday and Sunday to my dad's restaurant in Howard Beach. And he was the most nicest little old man. You know, was, I, to me, I felt like he was an extended family member. But that was my lesson in discretion. And then if you fast forward in 2009, like I write in my book, I go downstairs to say hi to John Paulson, who's a big hedge fund, you know, uh, takeover king. I go down, let me say hi to Mr. Paulson. They reserved the basement, private room. And for some reason, they didn't want the waiters there. They just wanted the food to come out and everybody to leave the room. I didn't know that. So I just went downstairs. I said, Mr. Paulson, how are you? How's everybody? Great. I look up and, you know, they, they have tomorrow they're doing a hostile takeover of Bank of America. 
So these are the things that we see as restaurant tours. Now, if I was corrupt, I'd be buying warrants and options as soon as I got out of that room. But no, you know, this is just part of our life as a restaurant tour. So what was your full time restaurant experience? Like when did you you, you joined your dad you know, for for how long? Did you yeah, so I, I finished high school a year early. Uh, not that I was good at school. I was like 361 out of 363. But I finished school in 11th grade because I knew I wanted to get the hell out of here. And then when I got a taste of a fraternity in my 11th year of high school, uh, I was in school, I got a taste of a fraternity, uh, you know, playing beer pong and this and that. I, I was just a different kid. You know, my, my, I told my dad, I came home that day and I said, Dad, I just got into a frat party. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to college. I'm not going to university because they don't teach entrepreneurship. And it's funny, that was a bold statement in 1984. But it's true today, too. Absolutely. They don't teach entrepreneurship. 90% of what they teach is something that you're never going to use for entrepreneurship. I know too many that have went to like Ivy League business schools that are selling cars. And there's nothing wrong with selling cars. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with selling insurance. But I don't know if you have to do four years of like Ivy League school to get there. I, I, I personally think that all the B schools and, you know, maybe the I, Ivy Leagues or any B school in the world, I think these are manufacturing units for consulting companies. Yes. And, and to me, what they are is that they, they groom you to live someone else's dream. They groom you to be a VP of the status quo. They don't, they don't groom you to be an entrepreneur. And those are required. Those are required in the world. Everybody, everyone is not going to be an entrepreneur anymore. No, no, no and of course. Not, listen, not everybody's going to be an entrepreneur. I mean, I mean, I look at some people when they, they work their nine to five job, they come home, they have weekends off, they go on their vacations, they, they look 20 years younger than me and we're the same age. And I say, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I mean, they have a better, they might have a better life than me because I work 120 hours a week. Um, and, and there are times I haven't taken a vacation in seven years because things are, 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 are jumping on me. Books, author, um, over a hundred restaurants. I mean, you know, it's not easy to be an entrepreneur, but it's the only thing I know. It's the only thing that I want to do. I've never worked for anyone in my life. Oh, it's funny. So I did work for someone once. So my dad went to buy a diner when I think I was 16. He said, you know what I want you to do? I want you to go work with Mr. Spiris at his diner just so you can learn the diner business. 16. He goes, go, go spend a few weeks there and learn the diner business because mm. we're going to open a diner in about six months and I want you to be the manager of it. So within the first three days, I found out the kid, the, the owner's son was robbing the cash register. <laughs> so my father calls me up and he goes, he goes, I just asked you to learn. I just asked you to go and learn. Now the whole Spears family is up in arms because you caught the son stealing them from the register and you busted him. Couldn't you just go and learn and just shut your mouth? I said, no, that's only one way I know. He was stealing. Yeah. And honestly, I thought I was being set up. Because it was on my watch too. You had me there as an assistant manager. Well, the son of the owner, who was the manager, is stealing. I'm I, not going to accept it. I, I think ownership is a curse. <laughs> you know, the <laughs> sense of ownership is a curse. To your health. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like... We don't do this for our health. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter what the designation is. Who cares? Yeah, we don't do it for health, but we do it for our creative juices. I mean, I love what I do because I create something from nothing. And I, I, I don't drink. I don't do drugs. I smoke cigars, and I will tell you, that is my drug. When I can create something that's from nothing and watch it blossom, ugh, there's no better drug in the world. Damn. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, you know, when we had, like, the Zoom call, I, you know, I, I kept that call, and I was like, all right, you know, of all the conversations, I'm looking forward to this one oh, for thanks. sure. Because, and what you just said is something that, you know, I wish my wife was here because, because I, and I ask this question to a lot of people, you know, people who are, you know, at very, very similar frequency, I'll ask you that as well. With what you know about yourself, what you just said, uh, if you were not doing what you're doing, if you're not doing restaurants, with exactly the same personality and the skill set and the, and the, you know, mind, what else you would have chosen as a profession? Uh, it's funny. So half the more Fogans are lawyers and judges. And the other half are restaurateurs. So I will tell you, it did cross my mind for being a lawyer. So at 15 years old, I went to all the Howard Beach trials. It was mm -hmm. a famous, my uncle was the judge. And that was a famous case. Like that was when it was protests, it was riots, um, where, where in Howard Beach, a few white kids chased an innocent black kid on the street and uh, he was killed. And it was like the, it was, the, it was a really bad part of New York City. 
I think it was 1986. So I went, I, I, I actually went to the trial every day because I, I was interested in, in, in the process. And then, you know, it came to a conclusion that my, my grades are, my SATs are not going to happen. I actually went to do my pre-SATs because I didn't know what they were. And I got to the gym to do my pre-SATs and I asked the teacher, what is this for? She said, well, this is your pre-SATs and then you're going to take your SATs next month. What's SATs for? Well, it's for getting in for your university. I said, here you go. And I walked up and I left the gym. She's like, no, no, you have to do it. I said, no, I don't. Because I'm not going to university. I'm done. And that's that's how I walked out of my SAT. L- lawyers are pretty creative, huh? So, yes. But Not lawyer, the judges. But, I, I won't say that for but judges. But I, I, if I had to get a law degree, it would have to be in a third world country or like in Central America somewhere. Because there's no shot I was getting I was getting through law school. No, I, you know, I asked this question to myself and I was like, you know, I, I run a tech company uh, and I've been always been running tech companies. But, uh, you know, when I asked myself this question, it was for me, the answer was movies. Yeah. You know, if, if I'm like, I actually feel that, you know, when we are building technology, when we are building software, especially products, it's it's almost like, you know, you, you think about something, you cinematic. Yeah. You, you think about something, you gather the team, you paint the vision, it works, you release it audience applauds you yeah. you move on it doesn't it, they don't applaud you move on right you, it, it becomes a drug yeah it, and, it's a drug. and that drug can be addictive it is addictive yeah yeah i mean the creat- i don't have an addictive personality any <laughs> vice i've tried in my life it might have been one time i had no interest in trying it again so i only addictive personality i have is creating something from nothing that's the only addictive trait i have in my character absolutely i think i think and but does that does it also make you get bored? I get I have ADHD, so ADHD is. Oh, I think all entrepreneurs. I, I think it's not a problem. It's, it's a the, gift. It's a, it's a weapon. It's a yeah. gift. It's a gift. If anyone medicates it, they don't understand the true. Correct. The true <laughs> benefits. Yeah, totally. Of ADHD, I can multitask at a high level. While I'm talking to you, I'm thinking of three things right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can do it at the same level, and and that's what makes you a good entrepreneur. But it makes you horrible in school, because you know there I am looking at a math quiz and I'm like, how does this relate to the halibut in that box? You know, are you out of your, I'm not doing this. And my parents would go crazy because I used to sit at the desk and say, I can't do this. But one thing I did remember is I love Russian studies in 10th grade. I, I got like an A plus in that. I got an F and a D in everything. Russian studies and American history, flawless because I was interested in the subject. Mm. So when you're interested in the subject and yeah. you have ADHD, you'll hone in on it and you'll mm. do well. But with ADHD, if you're not interested, might as well just not write on the paper. It's not yeah, worth the paper. I, I, I think for entrepreneurs, I think ADHD is the requirement. It's a it's, gift. Yeah. You, and, you, and when I hear people that want to medicate it. it was, multitasking is not even a, an option. In fact, if you know that you're multitasking, then you're screwed. It is supposed to be our natural. first nature. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, it has to be natural. This happens to me all day long. So sometimes I'll find myself while I'll be in a brain freeze and forget what I started the conversation with because four more <laughs> topics are hitting my head. And it's true, it happens all the time. People and people see me sometimes when I'm speaking, all of a sudden I forgot where I was because other thoughts came into my head. And I will tell you, if you can multitask at a high level, you could be a top entrepreneur. That's that's absolutely, that resonates. And I'm sure, you know, almost everybody who's supposed to agree will agree. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all like I said, horrible at school. But there's a funny story. When I was ten years old, my 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 school, my my guidance counselor, my teachers brought me in. It's a very interesting story. It's a fun story to know. And they brought me in, and they told my mother and father that we think Stratus has special needs, and we don't think that this fifth grade class is going to. This fifth grade class is. It's not. He's not going to benefit from this. He needs to. We think he needs to go to special needs. So there's my Greek father with the big heavy Greek accent. Almost like a Tony Soprano type, <laughs> because he's like, I saw that in the, in the Soprano. What do you mean he fidgets? <laughs> I think that was out of the movie. <laughs> and he goes, okay, so he fidgets and he looks out the window, and you're telling me he's not interested. In, maybe, maybe what? You, maybe he's not interested in what you're teaching. Did you ever think of that? <laughs> the teacher shocked. This is like 1977. Yeah, it's full How dare you, immigrant Greek? You're gonna question us? I got a I got a master's degree in education, and my father barely graduated high school. And he's like, "Well, maybe you should, guys should teach these kids." My father was so ahead of his time naturally, because yeah, they don't teach us what we're interested in. They teach us how to take a test alone. When do you ever solve a problem alone in the real world? 
test is supposed to be, you're supposed to have help when you do a test. Mm. You're supposed to, if they would do testing with three people at a time mm. and give them broad problems to solve, oh, testing would be genius, but they don't do that. When do you ever solve a problem on your own? You don't. You, know, you, you, you have people around you and you work it out together. But anyway, getting back to it, see my ADHD kicking in? My, getting back to that, so my dad looks at them and says, okay, let's, I heard all of you complain about my son, mm -hmm. and I'm not doing this. What was the complaint? The complaint was is that I, I, I'm not benefiting from being in school. Mm. I'm not doing the homework or the lessons. Mm. And I always question a question with a question. They hated that. Like they would make a question and I would challenge it. They didn't like that. Not at 10 years old. And I, that was, I did that all the way through school. I would, they would ask me a question. I'd say, well, no, what about this? No, be quiet and listen. No, I'm not going to be quiet. So putting that aside, my father goes, listen, this is what I'm going to offer you all. And with a heavy Greek accent, I'll actually imitate him. I wish he was around. Listen, I don't care if you're gay or straight or whatever you are. All of you are going to come to the Chelsea Chop House Friday night as my treat. Bring your significant others, gay, straight. I don't care. He's already like, <laughs> he's already like putting them down. He goes, I'm going to hold the table for eight. And I want you to come Friday night at the Chelsea Chop House at my 200-seat restaurant. And I want you to see him perform. And then we'll have a talk after you see. So when they got there, they saw me. He goes, I'm going to, and then he finished it off by saying, let me tell you what you're going to see on Friday. Mm -hmm. The bussers are going to be taught how to bus. The waiters are going to be taught how to serve. The bartenders are going to be taught how to hold a glass. The hosts are going to be taught how to serve and host. And the managers are going to be taught how to hold a menu when they present it to the guests. And let me tell you, you're going to see a whole bunch of other guests that are not going to order until he shows up to the table and tells them what to eat tonight. And guess what? If he has to go back in the kitchen to break it up a little bit, he's going to be working with the chef behind the broiler. And then you're going to tell me that he's got learning disabilities? I don't know another 10-year-old that can do that. And if he was wow. 17 years old, as a, I would make him a manager. But I can't because of liquor license laws and things like that. But what this kid does at 10 years old while his little friends are getting tucked in with their chocolate milk at midnight, he's counting his tips at 1 in the morning and walking out of here with $100 in tips because he's running a 200-seat restaurant. And this was this was being said while you were in the room? Yes. Wow. And that's the support I had. You know, we'll, And he even said, because he was fair, we'll try to work on this education stuff, but you guys got to start teaching things he's interested in. Mm -hmm. My father was a big believer like in BOCES, where we were taught to like laugh at those kids that went to BOCES. BOCES is a business education school where teach you how to be an electrician, teach you how to be a plumber. Honestly, to me, that makes more sense than going to an A, a school because you're learning a trade. You're learning how to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, it's a vocational. Yeah, it's, yeah. Those schools are great, but we're taught to laugh at those kids. He's wanted to be a mechanic. You know, I know a few of those kids now. One owns a Mercedes dealership in Southampton. You know, Greg Burns. You know, yeah, those are beautiful stories. And, and that was like my journey when it, when it came to my father supporting me. What was the first restaurant that you synthesized, that you created? Um, so it, that's fun. So it was Kids Kingdom. Uh, uh, it was an amusement park in Long Island. It was my first business. My dad lent me $25,000 to buy the rights to the food and beverage of the amusement park, which included a 5,000 square foot building. It was like a Nathan style pizza and hot dogs. So when I bought it, uh, I gave the guy $25,000. This is 1987. Mm -hmm. I was like 19 years old. And um, it was doing about $3,000 a week in sales. You know, hot dogs and pizza and some birthday parties. I said, okay. I played drums at the time. I said, okay, no problem. This is what we're going to do. We're going to make a tea night on Friday and Saturday. We're going to have Battle of the Bands on Friday and Battle of the DJs on Saturday just for kids because it's a kid's place. Mm. We're going to charge $20 at the door, unlimited pizza and soda. And that's what we're going to do on Friday and Saturday. I went from $3,000 to $40,000 a week. Like what? that. Yeah, I even had my 13 year old nephew uh, taking $20 at the door. I had to, it was going like this all night long. Wow. We went from 3,000 to 40,000 a week. And that's when, you know, the Toyota became a Porsche. And, uh, and, and all of a sudden I bought my first, I bought my first piece of real estate. I bought a four story, you know, four store building. I wasn't even 20 years old because I hit it. Now my awesome. father, my father couldn't compete because, you know, I went from making $700 a week to, you know, eight to $9,000 a week. <laughs> And, that, and then I That's sold it. That's wild. Yeah, I was I was not even 20 years old. I turned it into a kids' nightclub. 
Battle of the Bands Friday, Battle of the DJs on Saturday. And where did you go from there? From there, I bought property and then I opened uh, Hilltop Diner. Hilltop Diner was my dad's diner who first, then made me a partner. And with that, I was the first rest, first diner to put a three-star New York Times chef in a diner in Queens. And uh, it was actually covered on the cover of Daily News Magazine, Sunday newspaper. I was on the cover with my dad. And it said two generations fighting on what a Greek diner should be. And my option was, you know, the food sucks in a diner. We, we can improve. We can do better. Let's disrupt it. Let's tear it down and let's rebuild it. My father like, you're not going to be a spokesperson for the diner. The diner has been around for a hundred years. You're not. And I said, then you're, then I'm out. I'll go do something on my own. I had enough money at that time. I don't need to be here. Mm. If we're going to do it, we're going to do it my way. And he said to the reporter, I had to bend because I wanted him to be around me. So what we did was we brought Gabrielle Moran in. He just got three stars from the New York times. You can imagine how hard that was to convince him to come to a Queens diner from like Varick street in Manhattan. And all his job was fish, vegetables, salads, and pasta. That's his job. He got the omelets and the burgers and the Greek diner cooks with the cigarette and doing the eggs. Keep all that crap. I'm not changing it. But these are where we're going to improve. Mm -hmm. It was the only diner in the industry that you could not get in without a reservation on Friday and Saturday night. Wow. At a diner. <laughs> so from there, it became so successful. Me and Gabrielle went to Manhattan. We opened Gotham Diner in 93. And it just kept on going. Then I opened my first nightclub in 94. And then I was off to the races. Wow. That's, that's, quite, a, that's quite a story for New York. Yeah. But yeah. Then, then what about after 94? So and not, and so, I want to I know that, you know, how did we reach Brooklyn Chop yeah. House? And, well, 94 and is a funny story. And it's actually very relative to what happened this week. So in 94, I opened my first nightclub called Rouge. And it was on 54th and Park Avenue. Mm -hmm. you know, that was my dream. When I used to sneak out of my house at 15th to go to Manhattan nightclubs, my father never showed me that part of the business. My dream was always, when I went to my first nightclub with Stringfellows, I was 15. And when I saw a nightclub in Manhattan, that wasn't the Irish bar in Garden City where I grew up. It was like smoke and mirrors. And then I got to the bar and it was $20 for a drink. This is 1983. And I'm like, most kids would have had a heart attack. I was like, wow, 20 bucks? That's incredible. I, it made my night that it was mm -hmm. 20 bucks because mm. in my house it was $2. The possibilities is what I'm thinking right away, yeah. Yeah. what it could be. So I opened up this, uh, the, the night of the opening of the grand opening became where I really put, cemented my name. <laughs> it was very, very, by, by mistake. So it was the birthday party. Yeah, it was the birthday party of David Koch, the ener energy conglomerate. David, uh, Julia Koch was throwing a birthday party for David Koch. Mm. I met them through a friend of a friend. Henry Kissinger was there. Huge celebrities. And that was the opening of my nightclub, which was pretty cool because I didn't know what a celebrity was. You know, the only celebrity I knew was Susan Lucci from All My Children, who lived down the block from us in Garden City. So um, at the opening, I told all the security, I have 60 first cousins. None of them are coming in tonight. They can come tomorrow when we open for the general public. Tonight, it's Mr. Koch's birthday and everybody's got black tie. So my, my Nextel phone, brrr, beeping. That was the Nextel era, 1994, June. Um, they say, you got to make the call on this. I can't tell them they can't come in. I said, man, meanwhile, I had a few drinks at this time. Um, and That always helps. Yeah. And then, so I, I go, oh, man. So I get to the front door. It's a black guy with a do-rag and a blonde girl with a Yankee bomber jacket with a Yankee hat. And I'm looking at them and I'm like, no, no way. No way. And I just like, I don't want to hear it. You got Henry Kissinger here. I have like A-list, Fifth Avenue, Park Avenue, like this. No way. And I walk back in. So my next tell is going off at six in the morning when the New York Post comes out. What did you do? You're crazy. What did you do? Did you just ruin your business? Like, what did I do? It was a great night. The Cokes were, everything was fabulous. So I run down, this is before the internet. I run down with like my, my pajamas down to the corner to get the New York Post. I open it up. And there's a picture of me going like this. And it says, new kid on the block re rejects Tupac and Madonna. And that was my entry into the night, night into press. Wow. New kid on the block rejects Tupac and Madonna. <laughs> and that was my, that's when I first met him. And he came back again. <laughs> we actually had, were friendly for about a year. But it said, new kid on the block rejects Tupac and Madonna, Whoa. which were the hottest couple at the time. And it was all by accident. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't recognize them. I had no idea. And uh, 
So all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I'm Mr. Tell me that was a plan. No, it was no plan. It was (laughs) was a mistake, but I became really cool. I was not cool at all. I became cool. They're like, who is this guy who rejects a couple that gets paid 20, 30,000 just to walk in a big nightclub and I'm not letting them in? So I'm thinking maybe I killed my business. Boom. The nightclub was like, Everybody wanted to get oh, that. lines all the way from Lexington to Park Avenue. We were in the middle of the block. Lines all night. It was like almost Studio 54 vibe. Everybody wanted to get into this club that Madonna and Tupac couldn't get into. And it was all done by mistake. And then Niall Rogers calls me about two weeks later, the producer, Niall Rogers. And he says, listen, Madonna wants to come back. He actually produced like a virgin for, for Madonna. And meanwhile, I'm, I'm in like an office with like four people in the office. And I have to put it on mute for a second. I'm like, I am not worthy. I'm not worthy. And then and then everybody's laughing in the office. I'm like, can she come back? I don't care what the hell she wears. Of course she can come back. So I didn't say that. So I get back on the phone and I say, listen, Niall, as long as she dresses cool, we're cool. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, no, she's coming. So guess what? She comes with Sam Cassell. Yeah. Sam Cassell is a basketball player. The Houston Rockets are playing the Knicks. She comes in. She wants to apologize. No apology. I put him at a table, bottle of champagne on me. You know, I just wanted to make amends, amends, blah, blah, blah. So two days later, everybody's beeping on my phone again. And they go, put on Channel 2, Entertainment Tonight. I said, what did I do now? I turn on the TV. Sam Cassell's wife in their Houston suburban home is throwing all his clothes out the second story window of the house (laughs) because he spent the weekend with Madonna at at Rouge nightclub instead of practicing for his all uh, for his playoff game against the Knicks. He was out rendezvousing with Madonna. So you were. I never saw Madonna again. (laughs) All the paparazzi were outside. Yeah, Rouge was not a good place for Madonna. (laughs) It wasn't a good fit. But that was my entree into that's PR. That's awesome. Into PR. That's, that was my entree. That's full gangster. It was all by mistake. <laughs> that's awesome. And and where did the life, like how did the life move from there? Yeah, so in 1996, I brought the Fulton Fish Market onto the internet. Talk about full circle. I had the blessing of all the gangsters. 96. 1996. I was number five on AOL after Ted Leones is the founder of AOL. I had like the fifth email, 1995. So I knew this thing called the internet was really cool. I knew that this was the future, Mm -hmm. but I didn't know there was a ball under a mouse. I had never used a computer before. So I just learned this all on my own quickly because I Mm -hmm. knew that this thing, this screen is going to be the... I think people, I I don't think people nowadays know that there used to be a ball under the mouse. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I didn't know it either. For for, for all the wrong reasons, I didn't know that there was a ball. I go, what is this? A ball? I had never touched a computer before. I, I don't think kids today can it's even imagine not. that no. there was a ball under the yeah. mouse. And I, but I didn't, like I said, I didn't, I didn't know for the wrong reason. <laughs> I, I was just complete com- computer illiterate. So I taught myself really quick. I brought the Fulton Fish Market onto the internet. And I went from basically, you know, five orders a day to a thousand orders a day just by buying keywords. I went on AOL, Excite, and Yahoo, and I bought a thousand keywords for about $3,000 a month. Mm -hmm. That's my investment Mm -hmm. in the business. Mm -hmm. I bought lobster, steak, legal, seafood, uh, Omaha, steaks. Everyone that was a competition, they didn't know what keyword search terms were. I bought everything, but I bought the word flower. And this was a pivotal part of my life. I get a call from Jim McCann, the the founder of 1-800-Flowers. He says, "Um, I'm Mm -hmm. sorry, there was a mix up, but we have the trademark for 1-800-Flowers you've got to return the word flower. I said, you own 1-800-Flowers. I own flowers. I own flower and flower is plural. He goes, you want to litigate? You know, I, I mean, I'll, I'll bury you. I said, bring it on. And I said, let's go. I, I, I own it. You, you, you bought the .com? Or? No, I bought the keyword. Keyword on the so Yahoo? So if you went to Yahoo, this was before Google. I went to Yahoo, Excite, and AOL. And if you typed in flower, FultonMarket.com popped up on the screen. Got it. Yeah, And I had a really cool logo. It was a fishing net. It said, from the net to your home. So my investor at the time was Mitchell Modell, who actually put up money to take me to the next phase. He owned Modell Sporting Goods. Big, you know, now they're not around. And he goes, well, what's going on? Jim McCann just called me. He's like, why are you being an asshole to this guy? This guy's an important friend of mine. I said, he just accused me of stealing his word. When He owns flour the way I own water. What do you mean he owns flour? But by the way, why did you take flour? What? Why, why did you buy that keyword? Because it was something that you buy for gift giving. And, yeah. I, and I had gift giving items. 
So the word flower, you use it for gift gifting. Mm. You see flowers, my, my stuff is popping up. Got it. Oh, I did a lot of crazy things. You bid, I put 1,000 lobsters up for auction. Like the old Fulton Fish Market. That's how they used to buy from the ships. I did 1,000 lobsters for $2. And those things jumped up to $160 for two lobsters. And, and uh, it was called youbid.com. <laughs> the the trade-off was you put me on the screen, uh-huh. uh, on their on their homepage, we'll just get millions of visitors a day, and I'll give you the lobsters for free. I actually made money on the lobsters because everybody, when they start auctioning, they always want to beat each other. But here I am with the ADHD. I just got off the topic again. No. <laughs> um, so with Jim McCann, me and Mitchell Modell go to Westbury. We go to his office. I sit down with him and I said, okay. He was like, oh, you're ready to give us the word back? Mm. I said, no, it's a negotiation. Why would I give it back? I make a long story short. I said, how are you doing on Father's Day? And he said to me, that's a real wise ass comment. I said, because I know you don't do well on Father's Day but I got a solution for you. Let's do two lobster tails, two filet mignons, a steak knife, a Peter Luger steak sauce, a tiramisu cake with big fat steak knives. Let's do a masculine gift for Father's Day. He's like, I like that. And he brought like three of his people in. I said, in exchange, you're gonna put FultonMarket.com on the homepage and let's try it for Father's Day. And then if it works, I will give you the words back. But until then, I'm not giving you anything. And he goes, deal. So he came in and redid all my systems where the FedEx, instead of me putting them on the box one by one, the machines are just putting them on the boxes, systemized everything. Probably gave me like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in 1996 of all systems. All of a sudden, tractor trailers pull up at the bay because we're at the Models Return Warehouse. Two tractor trailers pull up and it says FedEx. And I'm like, what is that? And then I, they go, look at the screen. Wow. There's 9,000 orders from 1-800-Flowers. And the 9,000 orders came out to like $600,000. I don't think I did more than 40,000 a month. <laughs> and that was all leveraging those stupid $20 keywords. Wow. It became so big. I went from like eight employees to 185 employees. And this is during the dot-com days where there was no profiting. Mm-hmm. We were extremely profitable. And, um, and then he said, let's keep it going. This is incredible. We went Mother's Day, another 9,000 orders. For, you know, Valentine's, every holiday, we were on the... And, then we were and on why the this was going on your nightclub? My nightclub was still running, but it was on its own. Um, you know, and and, and I, I stopped the nightclub in 99. Um, and all of a sudden, I gave back his $40 keywords, flower and flowers. And that was a lesson about what, what search engine optimization means mm. in 1996. Yeah. Yeah, that is big. That's 996. Right. But then what happened to the business? Like, so you know, dot com the crashed. Dot com. So what happened was I took venture capital. That was the biggest mistake I made. They, they put like $4 million in and they just, they said, we don't, I go, we're making 800,000 a year profit. Was it a Valley, Silicon Valley fund or somebody in New no, York? No, New York, New York, New York City fund. And Models, you know, we had a fund that was offering us 35 million for a 100 million valuation. But Models is like, you're doing that just for business plans. We want 200 million. I'm like, you guys can't only make 800,000 a year. These numbers were insane. So we, we went with this, this other firm, which was like a New York City based, uh, sponsored by New York City. And we took a few dollars from it, you know, a few million dollars. But um, that was the worst thing I ever did because the dot com crash, they told us, don't worry about profits. We don't want to see yeah, profit. Burn money. Burn the money. Top line revenue, top line revenue, so we can go public. And we burned the money. We burned our credit. And then when the dot com crash, when they told us we can come back for more, they said, no, now we're going B2B. We're not doing direct to consumer anymore. And that was like 2000. And such a shame. I should have stuck to my laurel, my, 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 my principles. That, that company could still have been around today. Mm, but, wow. Yeah, that was powerful. Yeah, we, 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 were, we were making, we were doing like $6 million a year off a website that people didn't know what a website was. That in 2000. Yeah, in 2000. A- right? Amazon was still a baby. Correct. I mean, not in 2000, but... No, yeah. there was the the cover of Barron's, Amazon.org, a nonprofit company, or Amazon.fraud. You know, they, oh. oh. They got destroyed. They thought Jeff Bezos should be in prison. You got to look at the old Barron's articles. Mm-hmm. They destroyed Amazon. They said Amazon is the biggest fraud. Their model is lose money per every item, but we'll make it up in volume. <laughs> no, they, 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 they treated him like a fraud. But I think I think the business of venture capital, you know, back in those days, even till today, honestly, it's not really understood well by, you know, the common people anyway, uh, because you are like when you start doing business in negative margins. I mean, you look at 
almost even in the food industry, if we go back to the restaurants, you know, how many tech companies in the restaurant space, they are continuously losing money on the unit, yeah. right? And they, you know, it, it's very hard for hardworking, profit churning businesses to yeah. really understand what the hell is going on there. Correct. I, I mean, and that's, um, that's part of the journey. You have to decide what you want to be though, and you have to fund it accordingly. There are businesses where you should lose money, you know, to you grow the infrastructure and the and the and the R and D and get everything in place and 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 have you know grow into your payroll. It's a beautiful luxury to have. But yeah. You got to burn a few million dollars to get there. For sure. So you know, your your that shut down in two thousand. Shut down combust. in two thousand. A lot of lessons because you know at the end of the day it was a failure, and you have to embrace your failures, uh, even though it was a great ride. You know, I should never have taken that venture capital. What are you doing with all the creative energy and uh, the juices? I was writing his plan. So my wife and I went to Peter Luger's Steakhouse and she doesn't eat beef. She doesn't eat meat. And she's like, oh, I, I go, what? what, what? But I love my porterhouse steak. But and then all of a sudden I, I realized, put my feet in her shoes. I'm eating a porterhouse steak and she says cream of spinach, baked potato and a piece of fish with some parsley. I can do better at home. So she's miserable and I'm really happy. So I said, wouldn't it be cool? I'm always, I'm always driving. I said, wouldn't it be cool to take Philippe Chow menu and marry it to the steakhouse? Mm. And we create LSD. She's like, LSD? What, what are you talking about? Now you're talking about drugs? I said, LSD will be the ultimate surf and turf. And she goes, what the fuck are you talking about? I said, salt and pepper, ginger, garlic, lobster, a la chow. Dry age porterhouse steak, 35 days dry age with some sea salt like every other steakhouse, infrared oven, married to Peking duck. Lobster steak duck, LSD. She's like, <laughs> she's like, how did you come up with LSD? I said, I don't know. I just got a picture in my head that the ultimate surf and turf, which needs to be disrupted, and the steakhouse menu and the chop house Yeah, menu, these three generally don't matter. It's the same menu for 150 years. Cream of spinach, baked potato, shrimp cocktail, great steak, everything else sucks. I said, can you imagine if I married the two cultures together the co-stars, which will be the Chinese food, will be just as good as the star, which will be the 35-day dry-aged porterhouse steak. Mm. And that's where the concept came with LSD. I have it on all the uniforms. LSD, culinary trip. Let's take a culinary trip. That is awesome. And then it came down to doing the dumplings. I said, I don't want to do pork, crab, shrimp, and veggie. Let's do pastrami. When you go to a great chop house, what do you get? They have a great burger. Let's do bacon, shirt, cheeseburger, shumai. Let's do lamb yudo dumplings. Let's do the Reuben. Let's do pastrami. Let's go. Let's keep that. The, let's keep that model going. The, 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 so you have pastrami dumplings. Yeah, and French onion soup dumplings, and matzo ball soup dumplings, and and, and, and soup dumplings like Zhao Bang, which is traditional soup dumpling. Wow. I put lobster bisque in it. Traditional chop house marries soup dumpling. So that was became really fun. Yeah, I, I, I read I read that you know the, the chop house is a play on chopsticks yes. and, and the and chop chops chop, right? or, or chopsticks chopstick. So when I asked Chef Skinny Mai, who was really my go to chef at Philippe, now he's with me again. I said, when you think of chop house, what do you think of? And he doesn't speak three words of English. He's like chop suey, chopper, hacker, chop. You know, chop this, hack this, chopsticks. And I'm like, wow. When I think of chop house, I think lamb chop, pork chop. Isn't that interesting? Two cultures with two completely definitions of the word chop house, which remember hadn't been changed for 150 years. Mm. So it was funny. So I knew that it was going to be called chop house because on my dad's deathbed, I promised him that I was going to bring back the Chelsea chop house. So I used his font and his logo. And I said, it's going to be chop house, but I don't know what the name is going to be of my steakhouse. So when we, when we were at the place, which is, you know, literally looking at the, you know, right, 30 feet from the Brooklyn Bridge. I said, what do we call this thing? City Hall Chop House? Nah. Spruce Street Chop House? Nah. Oh, the bridge. The bridge Chop House. And I'm like, oh, that's it. I'm like, no. Brooklyn Chop House. That's <laughs> it. And I'm like, I'm ripping my pants from my credit card. I'm looking on Google, Brooklyn Chop House, nothing. I go on wow. cheap, cheapdomain.com. Brooklyn Chop House, available, $9. Credit card, done, this, that's it, $9. Brooklyn Chop House was born. And, wow. And my highest projection there was $4 million a year. And it's the worst location in Manhattan. By far the worst location. Very hard to get to on the side of the Brooklyn Bridge. You have to go around. It's on the Manhattan side. Yeah, Manhattan side of the oh, Brooklyn okay. Bridge. But it's a horrible location. It was a Denny's. I converted a Denny's into 
my version of a steakhouse. And the highest projection we had was like $3 million a year. And we did not. How large is it? Like what's the square uh, footage? 200 seats, 4,500 4, square feet. All right. Okay. $9 million in that space. Wow. And it, and it has never gone down. Wow. And How then, long has it been? So we opened in 17. And I remember going because now, you know, I I went through some bad times right before that, 13, 15 to 16. I got robbed a lot of money uh, by ex-partners. And um, I remember now I was high up on my horse again. I've had like three roller coasters in my career. But that's the life of an entrepreneur. I, I signed up for it. So I go to my doctor in January 2020. I said, Doc, my marriage is good. My business is booming. So it's got to be my health because I've never had a trifecta. It's either my marriage sucked and my business was great or my business sucked and my marriage was, was oh, I never had all three at the same time. So I'm telling you, I, I'm a paranoid and, and, and I know the law of averages. My health has to be bad. Something has to be wrong with my You're health. You're kidding me. You, you basically went to your doctor yeah. proactively. Yeah. January, like there, was no health, there was no health problem. No. January 2020, I said, I want a full physical. I want an MRI. Oh, no. There was something wrong with me. And he goes, I'll do it. It's fine. Because, you know, at that, at that age, I was... 48 years old, 50 years old. Yeah, uh, no, 52, sorry. I said, he goes, I'll do it. It's preventive. You haven't been to the doctor in a couple of years. Let's do it. So he goes, Stratus, listen, you know what? You had a rough couple of years. I went through like a bad divorce or whatever. And he goes, you know what? Enjoy it, man. You know, it's, you're, you're on a good ride. Accept it. Don't, don't worry. You're good. Business is good. Your health is good. Marriage is good. Then came March, 2020. I called him back and I said, I told you, <laughs> COVID hits. <laughs> and when COVID hits, I shut down a $9 million, $8.5 million a year restaurant. And I told you I can't have all three at the same time as an entrepreneur. And uh, when COVID hit, it turned my life upside down. But what we did, did was... Did you shut down? Yeah, we shut down. I mean, we, we, I'll tell you what we did. We shut down just for a week. Yeah. And I said, you know what? I want to tell my grandkids one day what I did during COVID. So I called Cisco and all the restaurant supply companies, Junior's Cheesecake, the fish guys, and all because I knew they had excess food products. I said, let's start donating stuff to the hospitals. So I, I started donating like lobsters and steaks and wine to New York Presbyterian, which is a block away. They start posting it on Instagram, which I saved everything. You know, Brooklyn Chop House, thank you, thank you, thank you. Then, the, and I don't believe stuff like this should be exposed, charity. But because of this Instagram, like catching viral, because this is March 2020, no one thought about this yet. Mm. Everybody was in a state of shock. And I'm just donating and giving food away, which we couldn't afford, but we were doing it. And then the New York Post does, you know, they, they named me as hero of the day for feeding health work, healthcare workers. So then it just blows up. People are calling me for GoFundMe pages, uh, donations, this and that. And I'm like, I don't do GoFundMe because I don't, I, we're all hurting. I, I don't want it. But the big guys, the restaurant supply guys, start sending me stuff. Let's up this. I had it so big. I was doing about four or 500 meals a week out of like six to seven SUVs were pulling up. I was loading it up with free food and going to every different hospital. And I did that for six months straight. And then what happened was- For six months. Yeah, we did, we did 8,900 meals from March to July. And all this while you were not, I mean, the, you did, restaurant was shut. Yeah, but I got to tell you, it built our morale because we saw the things on Instagram. These thank you Instagram posts were really impactful, especially to my staff. They were like, all right, now we have a purpose. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. And then I became an advocate against government when they really shut, when it was time to open, they shut us down again. And they weren't following the science. And meanwhile, every shopping mall is open. So if you've seen me on Instagram, you'll see that I was on from Tucker Carlson to, and I, I don't take a political side. I just go wherever there's a pro-business platform, but I became a huge advocate. I told Governor Hochul on Tucker Carlson, come and arrest me. I'm not firing anyone for a jab for a job because these same people that work for me were feeding healthcare heroes mm. instead of taking unemployment. They were taking, they were feeding our healthcare heroes. Can't even say the word workers. Healthcare heroes, because they were in a war zone. I've yeah, saw what they were. Yeah. It was, what they did is, is yeah. Not angelic is bravery. I mean, I don't know if I could do it. Yeah. And I'm going to go fire my server because he got two vaccines or one vaccine. So I went and I grabbed my guy, Alex. I said, Alex has one vaccine. I did this on Instagram live. 
Alex just got COVID. Two weeks later, he recovered from COVID. Technically, I can't give him his job back because he didn't get the second or the third vaccine. But his doctor said he should not get another vaccine for at least six months because he has natural antibodies. Mm. I'm not firing. So Tucker Carlson, you know, got a hold of that. He's like, you got to come on the show. So I come on the show and it's there. You can watch it on my Instagram. He goes, I think you're going to say something. I can't believe you're going to say it is how he starts it off. I said, I'll tell you right now, I'm not following the mandates. Uh, I'm I'm not saying I'm pro-vaccine or not vaccine. The truth is I'm vaccinated. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not firing my staff a jab for a job. Governor Hochul, come and arrest me. And I did this in front of like 4 million viewers. And and Tucker Carlson was great. He's like, hey, when she shows up, just call us so we can send the cameras (laughs) when you're being arrested. But I found a purpose now. Mm. I was a very loud advocate for this follow the science bullshit. And the whole thing is bullshit. And you have people that never ran a lemonade stand or created a, one single job in the private sector are deciding on what small businesses yeah. should do. Yeah. Wait a second. Didn't you say, uh, I called Comrade Cuomo on Fox. I didn't say Governor Cuomo. I said Comrade. Comrade Cuomo, my, my communist leader. And, and Mayor DeLauzio. I said, didn't you guys say 74.5% of the spread is based on um, home gatherings? And didn't you say 1.5% of the spread is restaurants? But you're going to close restaurants in December, the most celebratory month for every culture? And you're going to, you're going to shut us down? Where is the logic to that? But trust me, you know, I mean, from, my, from, from our vantage point, I think we saw COVID reactions, you know, across the world. Because, you know, we had restaurants, you know, we, we worked with restaurants in 50 plus countries. And, and I can tell you that I think COVID was just a shit show, you know, when it comes to restrictions and, you know, authorities in almost every country and every state. I, I, I think the only, one, state, the only state that got it right was Florida. Hate him or love him. I don't care what you think, because I don't care about politics. Last time I voted was Ross Perot. I don't vote. I don't believe on either side. Not because I don't want to vote. I just think they're both full of shit. But I voted for Ross Perot in 1992. It was the last time I voted because we need a businessman in the White House. No, for and sure. he was the last businessman that should have been in the White House. Since then, it's all full of BS. Mm. And remember, you got to think about this. I can't run a, a trillion dollar budget. And I think I'm pretty good at business. You got guys that have never ran a lemonade stand and you want them to balance a budget? You want them to cut out the pork? You want them to to run this business, they never ran a small business. Mm, mm. And, and that's why I attacked. I attacked on every front until I was heard. And uh, Cuomo, oh well, man, he, he had so much to say about me. You know, he was like, oh, I'm misguided. This. No, no, I'm not. Debate me. I asked him on, on Fox with Steve Forbes, you know, from Forbes magazine. I said, I'm telling you, Governor, come and debate me. I want to talk about your averages and how you're treating us as small business owners. Yeah. Why don't you shut the shopping malls down? Why don't you shut CVS down and all the big box retailers? Why are you always picking on the restaurants? Where, by the way, the consumer is safest in a restaurant. Why? You made us get HEPA filters. You made us get dividers. You made us get all these things. And then you shut us down? Did you do that at CVS? Mm. You'll never win that debate. And that's what I said on Fox multiple times. So did you, did you shut down? Uh... Yeah, we, ha- we, we, we had to shut down. But at that point, now Brooklyn Dumpling Shop is about to open, and I defied all of it. I never shut down when they said shut down. I never fired my staff. I said, come and arrest me. I'm not doing this again. I'm not doing it again. And that's where I took a very strong stand. And, you know, I, I just thought it was a complete injustice on, on many no, levels. For humanity sure. and business. Absolutely, I think. Uh, but post-COVID, once you're... Well, well, yeah, there, there's a great story about, you know, and now, now I've taken down my charitable hat and I put my entrepreneurship hat. So I get a call from David Friedland. Friedland is the largest real estate developers in Times Square. Mm-hmm. And he says, Stratus, Buffalo Wild Wings just handed in the keys for 25,000 square foot restaurant on 47th between Broadway and 8th. He goes, Could, would you convert that to a Brooklyn chop house? And this is now May 2020. Now, I'm in the Hamptons right now with my wife. She's got a hazmat suit on, hiding under the covers. And I said, David, I'll be in, I'll be in the city in an hour and a half. My wife said, where are you going? I said, I, I don't know. There might be a deal. I, I got to go to I gotta go to the That's city. That's at Times Square? Yeah, Times Square. So I get to Times Square, and I'm the only one in Times Square. It's a Friday afternoon. 
Fast forward four weeks later, we're ready to sign the lease. 25,000 square feet. I, I wrote a deal that was just unfair, but I did it in May 2020. It was such a one-sided deal. I actually got paid to own a 25,000 square foot, 700 seat restaurant. I got paid. By the time all the construction was done, I had three years rent free. I had a $3 million check from the landlord to convert an existing $15 million restaurant. Wow. So when are these things going to happen to a small guy like me? They're not. Those are for public companies. Mm. But I signed the lease in May 2020 in Times Square. It was my lawyer, myself, and the, and the landlord. And we were the only ones in Times Square on a Friday at 2 o'clock. Rent free for the last three years? Yeah. Wow. Uh, he asked me, what, he goes, we really want Brooklyn Chop House here. What is it going to take to get it? I said, I'm going to write these things down. I'm almost embarrassed to tell you, but you're not going to like it. Three years rent free, three million dollars, eight percent lease capped at a million dollars, uh, COVID clause for any socialist leader that shuts us down again, it reverts to eight percent with no base. I said, and I told the lawyer, put socialist leader. Let's get that on paper because I, I want to <laughs> save that. And I just wrote down these incredibly one-sided terms. Twenty-five year lease. I wrote all these terms down. I said, Mr. Freeland, I'm putting my jacket on. I said, here it is. I, it. I, I, I was trying to talk him out of it. And that's a star restaurant today? What's that? that that's your star restaurant yeah, today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do. We do like, you know, three, four thousand people a week. Three, four thousand people a week. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, 700 seats, five stories with a rooftop. And it's it's massive. You know, and it's Brooklyn Chop House. And I never would have done that deal again if the opportunities, Buffalo Wild Wings, handed in yeah. the keys. So Mayor Adams was there at the grand opening. We had Fat Joe and Mary J. Blige did a concert uh, in the restaurant. And um, so I saw I saw uh, Mayor Adams. I said, you owe me the key to the city. He's like, for what? <laughs> I said, what do you mean for what? I got rid of the only Denny's and the only Buffalo Wild Wings in Manhattan. <laughs> you owe me a key to the city. I got rid of Denny's at Chop House number one. I got rid of Buffalo Wild Wings, Chop House number two. You owe me a key to the city. And he started laughing. And Brooklyn Chop House opened uh, in May 21. And what are you doing with Dumpling House? Uh, so we're up to about now. 250 franchises, territories sold. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to announce in the next seven days two celebrity investors. Um, they are household names. We haven't closed yet. We're at the last stage of closing. And that's going to be super exciting because they're buying a third of my company. Mm hmm for a substantial amount of money, but it's not really the money that, per se, their influence and power. Let's put it this way, I have three billionaires as my partners and their resources that come with it as they are conglomerates, in each one of them. Uh, but we've sold about 300 franchises. It's the first contactless restaurant and uh, three employees can service two to 300 customers a day. But this is more like a shop and shop model, right? It's a fast casual. Mm -hmm. They range from 200 square feet to, to 1200 square feet. Average is about 800 square feet. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what I've done now, like I took a page out of Chop House because that's mm -hmm. where this concept came from. Anything that was once a diner classic or a sandwich, I converted it to a dumpling. And people say, well, how did you get to a pastrami dumpling? I said, well, I, I'm a Greek diner background owner and I've had Chinese restaurants for 15 years. Hence, pastrami dumpling. And how's, how's, that, how's that been? Received? Again, we, we did this through COVID, so there are a lot of challenges. It looks like we see the, 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 the light at the end of the tunnel. Store economics are great. Franchise sales are great. And we just got into 1,600 Walmart stores. Oh, wow. Yeah, 1,600. So you're going to have like a, like a 200 or a 400 square feet space in every Walmart? No. So it's funny you said that. We just got that offer yesterday. that They're offering oh, okay. us 200 stores to take over the subways inside the store. But no, our dumpling, our frozen dumplings in an APAC, are now available at over 1,600 Walmarts. Oh, wow. For five, five okay. dollars, $5 for eight dumplings. Stratus, your, your story is uh, worth making, you know, a trilogy <laughs> level movie on, right? Each each story and each phase was was actually, and, and, and of course, the storyteller that you are, I could almost see all of the scenes happening like <laughs> at funny. each time. So there's two movie options for the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. They are. Perfect. Right. So you also yeah, it's wrote. It's funny. You're, you're good at what you do because you just said something that I haven't told anyone. So just to be for, for transparency, I've never told anyone, but two big movie houses, I'm waiting any day for a letter of intent 
to make that book into a movie. I am not surprised at all. And that's, <laughs> that's awesome. That's... So you're the first one that's ever said that. No, actually, the reviews on Amazon, it's kind of common. I could see this as a movie. But for you to say that during an interview is kind of funny. Because I'm just waiting any day right now for two. two but that is super. As I said, I can. I, I could. I, I. I was a part of every scene that you painted, yeah. and that's that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. You also wrote this book, Be a Disruptor. Yeah, that's what the, that's where the movie options are. It's for the book. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna take this back. I'm. You know, um, I'm gonna ask you to sign it right yeah, after this conversation as well. Humble to do so. Status. Uh, you know, on the ending note, what what is it that you, you know, feel that you would want to say to entrepreneurs in the food space, in the restaurant space mm-hmm. today, three things, uh, you know, that you believe that entrepreneurs looking at restaurant space or are already working in the restaurant space should really, you know, be doing what you don't see a lot. Yeah, it, it, it's a great question. And this is how I answer it. And, you know, when I looked at a Greek diner, I could have just taken the diner and make a couple hundred grand a year and live a decent life. But I disrupted it. I, co- I totally dissected the concept of my dad's Greek diner. I reimagined it. I rebuilt it. And I did it my way. I've done that with everything I've done from the Kids Kingdom amusement park to the nightclub. I see things in a different way. And it's part of my ADHD. Um, and when I look at it, I, I tear it down. I never take status quo. I tear it down. I rebuild it. I reimagine it. And I do it sort of my way. I mean, now in the later years, I have a team around me, which is great. Sure. So I always welcome people that are smarter than me. And with that, you're disrupting. I've disrupted the chop house. I've disrupted the diner. I've disrupted the nightclubs. I've disrupted everything I've done. And what happens with that is that you have, a, have to have a little bit thicker skin for failure. So when you disrupt something, and this is what I teach all entrepreneurs, I teach seven universities now and I couldn't even get into college. And, I, and I'm really excited. To, I mean, that's something exciting for me. I love teaching university students. And I give them a lot of credit, the, the professors that invite me, because I'm very unconventional. Mm. I, I tell them stories that they're not teaching them in school. Yeah, I, and it's I, almost I, anti-education. I, I think most of the universities are teaching about people who did not go to universities themselves. But, yeah, yeah. And, and I'll end it with this. So when, when you disrupt something, you're going to fail more often than not. Mm. You're going to fail. Yeah. Your ratio for failure will be higher because you're doing something new. The market just may not be ready for it. But if you hit it, you're never going to hit a single or a double. I'll use baseball analogy. It'll be a bases loaded grand slam, like I did at Fulton Street, like I did at Philippe Chow, like I did at Brooklyn W. Like I did. There were grand slams. There were a couple of failures in between, which we really didn't get into. But that's the trade off. If you can stomach the failure, which I think everybody should process, everybody should go through failure. There's no path to success without it. You have to basically accept when you hit it, it's going to be big. And this is what I teach the college students, and I'll end it with this. Is a, a young girl said to me, um, I feel like a loser. My parents spent a quarter of a million dollars on my education. I'm a senior. Uh, you know, from It was Georgetown. It was uh, Fairleigh Dickinson. It was Fordham University. They all say the same thing. I feel like a loser because I don't know what I want to do. And I'm being told that I ha- I'm finishing university now. I've got to get a job because i got to retire in my 60s. I said, what? Who teaches you that? They're like, my teachers teach me that. And I said, well, that law was written in 1900 Mm. when the average life expectancy was 57. Mm. And and they're telling you to retire in your 60s because that law was written over 100 years ago. Here's the new law of thumb. I'm going to say it point blank. I need you to fuck it up in your 20s. Fuck it up. It's exactly what I say in front of all the students. I want you to fail, continuously fail until you find something that you love. And once you find something that you love and that you're passionate about, fix it in your 30s, start making real money in your 40s, and retire in your 80s. That's the new law of thumb. And with that, that's that's awesome. I resonate with every word. <laughs> I can't resonate enough with that. But that was a great conversation, Stratus. This Thanks. is This is a great journey. And the journey is on. You're, you're on to doing much, much bigger things. So, yeah. Thank you know, you. best of all the best for all the disruption that is that is going to happen happen from here on. And uh, thank you for doing this conversation. No, this was fun. Thank you for having me.